Hello, welcome to the June 7th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test and then we will begin. Bear with me just for a moment. Hello, welcome to the June. All right, sounds like my monitoring computer is fine. So um, my name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host of the live stream today. Uh, if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can ask questions in the chat field or simply uh, send questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Um, I will, when asking questions, if you could indicate which version of Cubase that you're running, as well as uh, if it's, you know, which version number, such as 10, 10.5, 11, or 12, if it's Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, uh, and which operating system that you're working on, that information will be helpful. Um, so, but, um, so when asking questions, and if you don't get an immediate response to your question, you could just simply uh, be patient. We'll try to get through all the questions chronologically, so if we could try to avoid asking uh, the same question uh, over and over again. Um, it doesn't get your question answered any quicker, but it just makes the whole live stream go quicker for everyone. That would be appreciated. Uh, we should have all of the topics covered in the live stream uh, indexed and pinned to the top of the comments field. Uh, so look for that. And if you want to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you can go to cubaseindex.com. And we want to thank Jan for creating that website. So it's an incredible resource of information. Uh, other great resources of information is you can check out the Cubase Nation Discord, and Jazz Dude does a lot of work with that, so we want to give a special thanks to him. And Jazz Dude and Agent K serve as moderators, uh, so we want to give special thanks to them. They're not Steinberg employees. They just kind of do this out for the benefit of the community. Uh, so we can give special thanks for their efforts for volunteering to make it a better community for everyone involved. Um, so one quick announcement of the next live stream, we usually do it on Friday. It's going to be kind of the end of school celebration for my son. So I'm going to, uh, postpone Friday's live stream to Saturday. So if you have friends that, you know, perhaps their schedules don't accommodate, uh, attending a live stream on a Friday because of work or other commitments, uh, we will do kind of the same time on Saturday. So 1 PM us Eastern. Uh, so hopefully we get a couple of new uh, people that, you know, maybe have other commitments. So, but just a heads up, we'll uh, continue on Saturday, the next live stream, and then we'll be back on our normal schedule for a bit. All right, so let's go ahead. And if you are watching the live stream live, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. I'm going to break out my chat and we will begin. It was great. I got to meet many different attendees that were able to uh, go to the NAM show. So it was wonderful to meet a bunch of people. All right. All right. So we see uh, Brian Grieve Music just had his studio painted. Okay, uh, so we see a uh, question. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, it will be nice to have more options on audio connections for Dolby Atmos. Example, uh, have numbers of speakers as we want with this starred mode of Dolby Atmos. Um, so, you know, depending on your configuration, like I think if we wanted to start doing kind of an audio configuration that when we go to uh, like add a, we'll just take a look at our Dolby Atmos. I think it's going to be uh, even for Dolby Atmos authoring, you know, people will generally for the authoring not go beyond like a 714. But let's see. Um, so I think we have some extended capabilities for channel configurations in Nuendo. Uh, but I'm not sure what you mean by uh, starred or mode of Dolby Atmos. So, you know, but a lot of people end up kind of, uh, you know, mixing binaurally. Uh, but those are kind of the standard um, Atmos uh, configurations for authoring what we have in uh, Cubase and Nuendo already. 
but let me know if I'm misunderstanding. Okay. All right, we have Stefan from Sweden. We see Jazz Dude on the live stream. Um, okay, so we have, uh, I see from Isaac, uh, just says some content cannot be loaded. Either licenses are missing or time limited licenses have expired scoring percussion instruments. Uh, let me just see if there's, okay. And it says on the other hand, the instrument appears in my Steinberg library manager. Thank you, Greg. So. Uh, I think this is, I, you know, I just got back from the NAM show late last night, and I think I saw this email about the, with screenshots at the scoring percussion. So make sure, one, that uh, you'd purchase the scoring percussion. Um, so that's a separate purchase, so that doesn't come with Cubase or Groove Agent. So that's going to be a separate library. Uh, so make sure that you have, uh, so if you could let us know if you actually purchased a license or you just downloaded the content and installed it, uh, so often the error messages that you shared were kind of with that. So you would have the content. I believe that's still going to be on the e-licensor. So let us know if you purchased the uh, scoring percussion library. That'd be great. All right. We also have Stefan from Denmark. All right, so we see uh, with standard mode, uh, and this probably, I think, going back to Dolby Atmos, I mean, six speakers, one subwoofer or two, and two speakers on top of the room. So that's what the 714 is. So, you know, if we think of the 714, uh, that would be, you know, your five, your, you have left, right, center, left, surround, right, surround, subs. So that's going to be uh, six speakers. Plus your, so that's your 5.1, and we have two speakers on the side, so that's uh, like 7.1, and the 7.1.4 uh, is going to be two speakers, like four speakers on top. So that's that's kind of the standard configuration that you have already. All right, so we see John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. We have Louis, Louis Che from Chicago joining us. All right, we have Jan from Stockholm just wishing, welcoming me back. So it was good. I missed doing the live streams. We see Michael Pierce on from London. And if he's calling, referring to London as the post Jubilee wasteland in the UK. So, all right, we have Cena from Colorado, Real Raven 2000 checking in, Brian from Denmark, Chris from San Diego, Bob Warren from Montana City. We see David Wood is mentioning that there was an update to the scoring percussion about the no license found, so maybe that would work for Isaac. All right, uh, so we see, uh, hi, Greg. Is there an easy way to bypass uh, automate all auto-tune first insert on every track uh, at once with just one master bypass with 70 plus vocal tracks automating individually can get very messy. Okay, so let's say if we add a number of audio tracks, so let's say if I want to select these tracks and I have a common insert on all of the tracks. So let's say I will Just come over here and let's say I'm going to activate Q link. So I'll add an insert across all of these. So let's say we'll do a pitch shift plugin. So we'll say like pitch correct, something similar. 
So now we have uh, this particular plugin loaded on all these tracks. So if I select all of the tracks that have that particular plugin loaded on them and we activate Q-Link and we could also do this by Alter Option uh, plus Shift that now when I turn all of these off, that all once Q-Link is turned on, so if I do this individually, without Q-Link, but with all of those tracks selected and we turn Q-Link on or off, we could bypass your 70 tracks of auto-tune uh, in one mouse click very easily like that. So let me know if that works. All right, so we have a question. Uh, when using the move, move tool as size applies time stretching to a certain event, how can I reset the event timing back? All right, so let me just open up a different project here. Okay, so let's say we switch our uh, sizing mode to sizing applies time stretch, and let's say I've now stretched this out to fit into that amount of space. So it's always, I think, if you undo, uh, you could just simply uh, go back to the original state, just, just like that. Um, so you could just simply choose to undo right afterwards, or if you... Uh, so if you just wanted to just take that, so that's actually just doing a time compression to make that amount of audio fit. So you could just do an undo command. And even if we have done that with some other edits, you know, we could just come right over here and kind of go through and through your undo history. So if we go to your edit history here, we can just say, okay, I wanted to just to resize and we could undo that particular event, that that uh, time compression or expansion right there. All right, so we see, uh, anyone know when the next update will be for Cubase uh, 12 Pro? I've had some issues with some plugins not working, I had to revert back to 2.11. So I think we'll see one pretty soon. Uh, pretty imminently, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, you know, and there's a lot of plugins that are, you know, as stuff gets tightened up and closer to specification, sometimes that can cause problems with some plugins. Okay, and Norton Wade is also just saying, uh, Greg uh, Norton from Augusta, scoring percussion had an issue on first release. Y'all released another update in three days. New release worked fine. Check form and re-download. So reiterate that again. All right, uh, so we see uh, from Michael Pierce, a uh, very quick question. If I extract chord from some audio in Cubase 12, is there a way to then quickly quantize the chord track itself? So it sometimes it will come uh, a little bit off. Um, so I don't think the events are kind of quantizable, but let's say if I have a uh, chord track here and I want to take this particular audio events. I'll just activate this project. All right. So we'll just do the analysis here quickly, generate our chord track. So I think if we have the snap enabled and you use the letter J, so say we look at this, we may notice that sometimes uh, if we zoom in that the chord track may be like a little earlier or a little offbeat. So if you have, and I don't think we could do this for multiple events, but if, you know, as you see need it, if you want that to, let's say if I moved, let me try moving one way off here. So 
So I don't think that there's a way to kind of, you know, snap these for multiple events. Uh, but if snap is enabled, you could quickly kind of just come over here, hit the arrow key to go to the next chord event. And then you could just kind of have it snap uh, directly to the grid there. So, um, but I don't know of a way to kind of quantize and have those kind of automatically snap um, like multiple events. So you may just have to hit the left, right arrow keys to kind of go through and get some stuff cleaned up if necessary. Okay, so we just see um, uh, from Brian Grieve Music, maybe not a Cubase issue, but I'm not sure how to fix it. Uh, my Windows taskbar keeps on pop up in Cubase when I move my mouse to the bottom of the screen. It's so frustrating. Um, so I think in Windows, if you come over here, you could go to taskbar settings if you by right clicking on the taskbar. So it's obviously a little different. I'm in Mac OS, so it's a little different, but try going into your taskbar settings and I think that should fix it for you. All right, so we have Soren checking in from Sweden. We see Mark Rabin from Montana. We see uh, Sir Robert, uh, no, I guess it's Soren as well. All right, we see from Neil, it says, uh, and this is, I think about the auto-tune, says, uh, I know of the Q-Link option, but my question is about automating the bypass on certain moments with just one master macro, quick control, whatever. Um, all right, so let's see if we could do that and have the parameters automated. So say as we're playing along here, and let me place all of the tracks into automation. Just select all my tracks here. All right, so let's say I want it to All right, so let's say if we now come over here to the plugins and we have quick link activated. that it looks like all those are going to be automated. So let's go ahead and just play it back and we'll see if they all kind of turn on and off together. So it looks like that seems to be automating it, but let me know if I'm misunderstanding. All right, uh, so we see I have a Mo XF8 connected to run to Cubase 12 Pro. There's a question of my MIDI port. How do I capture audio with the MIDI? So you're gonna have to connect the audio output of uh, the Mo XF8 directly to your audio interface. So you just connect the, you know, you could do MIDI over the USB port. Uh, sometimes you could do, you know, there's probably a good chance that it will pass audio over the USB port if it's configured that way. But if you have an audio interface, since that's a USB audio interface, you can't stack USB uh, audio interfaces to run multiple USB audio interfaces. So you need to just connect the audio outputs from your Mo XF8 uh, into the inputs of your audio interface and record. And it's one of the disadvantages of using a lot of uh, external gear, so as opposed to VST instruments, but you just need to actually capture the audio output. Okay, so we see a question. Hi, I'm currently trying to figure out how to upgrade to Cubase 12. Do I just pay for the upgrade since I already have 11? 
then where will be the download is somewhere 12. I'm confused in the process. So once you do the up great so let's say we just go to the Steinberg website all right so we'll come over here we'll click on Cubase let's say buy Cubase 12 we'll do Cubase Pro 12 so instead of the full version uh, I want to click here and we'll choose updates and I'm gonna update from Cubase Pro 11. So at that point, um, you know, once you do this, you could then download that will probably launch the Steinberg download assistant. So as soon as you go to the download assistant at this point, uh, this is a program that will pop up. So you would, you'll get probably a DAC code, a digital a download access code. So as soon as you have that download access code, you could just enter it in right here, and then you'll be, you know, and you'll get instructions with the program. So at that point, you would enter your download access code. So what it's going to do, it's going to transition your Cubase 11 license from an upgradable license once you have the upgrade to a non-upgradable license on the e-licensor. And it's gonna to transition to the new Steinberg licensing system. So once you kind of enter your access code here, at that point, you could just download your Cubase Pro 12 and, and run the installer right from there. So just buy it from the website, or if you have a dealer that sells it, like in the United States, we have Sweetwater that sells our updates as well. So you could do it right from there, and it should walk you through the process. All right, so it says, uh, just see, question sorry my chat field just jumped uh, so I see hey I'm on a um, I'm on a trial with Cubase Pro 12 but already have uh, it says S O L E so Okay, so it's already have elements. Do I qualify for a cross-grade upgrade? Okay, so it says uh, I'm gonna try with Cubase Pro 12, but I already have, um, already have elements. Do I qualify for the cross-grade upgrade? Thanks. Uh, so no, you don't qualify for the cross-grade, but you can upgrade directly from, um, so say if you want to uh, upgrade from Cubase elements, you could just do, uh, you know, directly here and upgrade from Cubase Elements. So you don't have to buy the full version, you could just upgrade from Cubase Elements to the full version. Uh, so we see, uh, hey Greg, uh, this a question from Benny from Sweden. Uh, hey Greg, welcome back, thank you. Uh, missed doing the live streams last week. Uh, question, is there any shortcut to set all volumes to zero dB with one click? Only the volume, thanks. So if we're in, let's say if I come here and we have all these tracks here and I want to set these tracks to all be at one at zero dB regardless of where their faders are, I'm going to select these and I'm going to just click on Q-Link and then uh, so, you know, select the channels. We could see uh, this absolute mode. So now when I just click uh, on a fader, they'll all be the same. And if I just click on one of the faders while holding down control or command, you, that will set it to zero dB. So if you're in quick link and have absolute, just hold down, um, so I'll just reset this. So say I have all of these kind of set independently. 
So now with Q-Link and absolute mode, I could hold down control. And I'll make sure that these are all selected. Sorry about that. So once we have that, hold down control and click on one of the faders and they'll all be reset to zero dB. So control or command and with Q-Link and absolute and then that should automatically enable it for you. See, I see Real Raven mentioning that he was, had quantized his chords, so let me just give it a shot. And I'll just quantize these to the bar. Oh, yeah, so yeah, uh, Real Raven's right. So, uh, so just select them all and then hit Q. So, and then that will quantize. So, sorry, thanks for mentioning that, Real Raven. Might have changed in a later version, or it could have been just wrong. Thanks for the clarification. All right, so I just see, um, hi Greg, I uh, hope you're doing well. Did you get, find out what the focus color is? I've kind of played around with that and I still haven't determined it and I kind of looked it up in documentation um, and uh, I didn't see it indicated there, but I do have a meeting where I'll, uh, next week uh, with some of the product planning, so I'll, I'll bring it up. So maybe next Tuesday's live stream, maybe I'll have an answer. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is it possible to change my emails on the Steinberg website with all my licenses? I'd like to convert all my music logins to one global email, including my Steinberg account. So I think that you could change your My Steinberg account. Um, I haven't done that so much, but I think that you could modify your My Steinberg account to a new email address, and maybe you could set it in your profile. All right, so we just see a question. Um, uh, hi, Greg, can you briefly discuss what uh, the sus and apps and lowers window mixer and how to, how to using, et cetera? So we just saw kind of like absolute will, so this will allow you to, um, to basically suspend the, your channel linking. So if we have these channels, let's say these mixer channels like this, and now we link our channels. We could just come over here and keep the proportionality of it. Uh, if we want to suspend the linking where this one we could move independently, at that point we could just suspend the linking and it will automatically, you know. Now if we turn that off, all these channels can be linked. So once we have our Q link enabled, their proportionality will be maintained. If we want these all to be the same value, when we click on the absolute value, now when I adjust one, they'll all go to the same value. So if I wanted to say, okay, this one needs to be a little bit louder, um, and then at that point, we could link, and if we take the absolute off, we could still keep that proportionality. If I say, oh, now this one needs to be a little softer, we could just come over here, suspend the linking. And now when we enable Q-Link again, we could just kind of easily modify that one particular parameter. So that's kind of the difference. So you could suspend or have it in absolute mode. So absolute mode puts it all at the same value. All right, so we have Eric Shin checking in from South Korea. Thanks for joining us. This is probably very late.
All right, so we see, um, so uh, we have a question. Can I run Cubase 12 Pro on my laptop and CPU? I'm on a cusp of upgrading from 11 Pro, but I'm curious if I'm able to run a single version on both my desktop and laptop. So yes, you could run it on up to three different computers. So that's really kind of the intention. So you could run on three different computers and with the end user license agreement, it's only supposed to be one at a time, but you could run it on three computers. All right, so we see based boomer, Chad Barris has been using Cubase since 1995. So it's great, thanks for joining us. And LibTech saying, remember, he remembers running Cubase as Atari ST. That's, that's where I got started. All right, so you see Tim Weinheimer's uh, just saying, rest in peace to Dave Smith, a true innovator. So yeah, he's basically the father of MIDI. So it was really sad to hear of his passing, especially right before the NAMM show. All right, so we see, um, says, uh, hi, Greg, a uh, question, uh, maybe a bit late, but maybe you've covered this. Uh, how do I alter MIDI to a more human feel, i.e. volume and note placement not being exact? Thanks uh, for all your help. So if you have, you know, let's say just a quick, you know, MIDI part that we want to uh, work with that's, you know, we want it, let's say, for drums, and we want something to be a little more, um, you know, humanized with it. So let's say I'll just take a couple measures of drums here. And I will just kind of put in some hi-hats. So let's say Okay, so let's say if you want to just come here. Um, so, you know, some of the things that you could do, um, you know, very easily is just to come over here. Just... Okay, sorry, let me just modulation or you know, fade out here in a master fader so I'll just alter that all right so let's say I just want to take you know something and make it a little more realistic so let's say I just have So let's say like the hi-hats are incredibly annoying uh, and we wanted to do, you know, there's things we could do just with um, the, in the inspector itself. So let's come over here to, um, so we'll just have this selected. And you could go to MIDI modifiers. So if you wanted to kind of Say, okay, I wanted to randomize velocity. So we can say, okay, our max velocity will make it, you know, 90 and 30. You know, but what I like to do a lot of times, um, so we, and we could also just randomize 
uh, not just velocity, but we could choose to randomize position as well. But a lot of times what I do, especially in situations like this and kind of high hats can tend to be the dead giveaway. So we could just say, I want to, and I think there's even a logical editor preset for this. Um, but let's say I wanted to take, go into MIDI. Let's go to like a logical editor. So I could do something like I wanted to take uh, type is equal to notes and we're gonna make that equal to, let's say F sharp one. And what I want to do is every other one. So we'll go to um, we'll say last event and then So we'll go to last event to every other event and we'll say event counter and I'll just say, okay, let's make this two. And then what we want to do is to take our velocity value two and let's subtract 40. So now when I do this, my hi-hats every other hi-hat will be just down 40 as we play this back. So now I could just. So you could do a lot of different things like that and there's different uh, presets. So if you wanna go to the logical editor, we could say, um, let's apply a preset. And let's say I wanted to do, it's probably under notes velocity. And I'll just even search for hat. Uh, every other hi hat F sharp one, we could select or every, yeah, every other hi hat F sharp one velocity minus 40. So you could just come over here and just kind of use presets like that to vary. So, you know, like velocity can make a huge difference uh, for all of your drum parts. Uh, and then you could use different components for, you know, randomizing pitch or placement, rhythmic placement, stuff like that very easily but you know first place would be maybe to come over here uh, another thing that people so you could use your midi modifiers and there's also like a midi insert plugin so if you wanted to add like a swing you could go to the quantizer plugin and at this point there's a swing factor and we could just set that to like a hundred So you could add swing and stuff like that without having to modify the MIDI events that will just kind of uh, process it in real time. All right, so we see, uh, it says, question I'm looking to buy a drum machine. What's the best to use by USB guys? Uh, I think the probably the best drum machine is going to be Groove Agent, uh, but you know, you know, most of them, you know, can be a bit of a pain to you know integrate in with your DAW. But you know, maybe other people, if you get to let us know if you're looking for acoustic drum sounds or if you're looking for um, more kind of electronic sounds, and then maybe people could give some more uh, more input. All right, and we have Spike Williams checking in from Wales. Great to, great to see you on the live stream. Okay, 
reading through comments. All right, so it says, question, uh, if I freeze all tracks with insert processing included, will the project play properly on another computer that doesn't have all the plugins and instruments used in the project? So yes, it will play back on a different computer. Uh, if someone's running Cubase, they could open up the Cubase project and you know include the edits folder with that. Uh, another way of approaching that to printing your tracks is also using render in place. Uh, and that will place the audio files directly on the project window and might be easier uh, if you're uh, integrating with people using different programs. Um, but it, it will allow the audio to play back if you have the whole project folder. The audio will be played back on other computers that don't have the same instruments and plugins. All right, and there's another tip for unstretching the audio, especially if you, so let's take a look at that quickly here. Uh, and this is from probably the project window. So let me activate this. Okay, so let's say if we time compress it, so if we go to audio, uh, to real-time processing, let's see if we do the unstretch audio, that will take you back to the original and you don't have to be in complete order. So thanks for pointing that out. All right, so we have Nick checking in from Sunny Essex, UK. Thanks for joining us. All right, we have music all day joining us. From Ypsilanti, Michigan, music all day, all right. All right, so you see uh, my software gets shut down on its own, what to do. Um, so if you let us know which version, like which operating system, but see a lot of times is when stuff kind of just shuts down, it, it could be kind of a plugin related. So see if you have the same behavior, if you're just using kind of stock plugins, you might be able to isolate it to a particular plugin that's misbehaving. All right, we see Samson Strike from Austria. All right, so we just see, uh, is there a setting to change the track level meters to show RMS level instead of peak level? Uh, no supervision could show RMS levels, but it'd be great to see it on every track simultaneously. So we have kind of the these meters in the mix console will be kind of fixed, but we could change the meter in supervision or just looking at the different master meter types here. But I think that's not applicable for the meters in the main project window. All right, so we see uh, also is there a, there's a lot of disturbance when I do ASIO guard, high, it goes away, but there is audio dropout. Um, so some of the plugins, you know, like I think if you're running plugins like under VE Pro, and let's say you have like, you know, your ASIO guard set, you know, most of the time I've always left mine at normal, but some, I think if we go into the plugin, some plugins don't like uh, dealing with, you know, ASIO guard settings. So I think if we actually click on a particular plugin that we could, uh, I think there's a way of maybe bypassing it if it's being, if it's using ASIO guard. So I think 
that some people will uh, bypass will bypass whether a particular plugin is using ASIO guard. So you, if you just come here, you can say ASIO guard enabled, then you could at this point choose to disable. So there could be, there are some plugins that don't like working with ASIO guard. So you might have to go through and disable those. All right, so a question, uh, Cubase Pro 12. Can Cubase Pro 12 still be used after upgrading Nuendo Pro 12? So if you upgrade it from Cubase Pro 12 to Nuendo Pro 12, um, you know, you don't have a Cubase license anymore, but I think, you know, 99.9% .9 of all the features of Cubase Pro 12 are in Nuendo Pro 12, plus it can... Uh, it can open up the Cubase project files, but if you know if you have a license of Cubase Pro 12 and a Nuendo Pro 12 license, uh, they could be run on the same computer, um, so they could run independently. But if you upgrade it to Nuendo uh, to Nuendo 12 from Cubase Pro 12, then you no longer have your Cubase Pro 12 license is now Nuendo license, but there shouldn't be any real consequences. So, all right, so we see, uh, thank you for all the answers. If I'm on Mac Mojave still, can I still download and use Cubase 12 or would I have to update my Mac? So we see people that are running on Catalina, um, but I just had a, you know, I just uh, was helping out a uh, kind of a famous engineer who is still on Mojave and you know when he would when he would start his system it would you know just kind of instantly crash but you know Cubase is for Big Sur and Monterey a lot of people run it on Catalina but I, don't, I think you'll need to upgrade your operating system from um, to update to a later operating system for best use all right we have Matt Elliston checking in from London thanks for joining us All right, uh, so we see, hi, Greg. Uh, I can use libraries, sound like a kick, snare, hi-hats, but when it comes to waves, loops, like sax or guitar, I don't know how to bring them into my project and use them. Please, can you show us? Um, all right, so let's say I just have uh, different loops here. So let's say I was looking for guitar. You know, So often what we need to do is you know, if we're working with loops, you know, we can go directly into, let's say I'll just go to this library and say, okay, I'm looking for electric guitar. So really all I would have to do is just to drag them directly into my project window like this. And if I wanted to drag these into a particular instrument, uh, we could drag it into like a groove agent kit. So say if we have a beat agent kit, I can come right over here and let's say, okay, I have this pad free, I can drag the audio. Two pads if I wanted to trigger or I could right click and create a sampler track. And once we have a sampler track, at this point I could just play. I could now just trigger the samples just kind of that easily. So um, you could drag it in as audio files into the project, uh, drag it to Groove Agent if you wanted to play it via MIDI, or drag it into the sampler track, which will also allow you to play it via MIDI.
Um, so we see, uh, hi Greg, is there a way to adjust the track timing value for each articulation in the expression maps editor? Um, sometimes the timing will be different between articulations within the same pitch. Um, so I don't know of a way to, so let's say if we wanted to look at uh, an artic something with articulations, let me just find a quick project. I think I have. Just open a quick project here. So I don't think it's going to be a way to, um, to offset each different articulation because uh, sometimes it's going to be more on the playback engine of the particular instrument that you're working with. It's not responding the same way. Uh, but let me just, we'll just open up a quick Schubert piece. Okay, so when you go to our expression map setup. So I don't know of a way to automatically kind of offset timing wise. And generally, you know, it should be consistent within <clears throat> the particular instrument or playback engine. Um, but I know that there's some discussion on, you know, adding more features and capabilities in the future. So I'll make sure to kind of bring that up. All right. We're also seeing uh, from David Woods, just indicating a Cubase Pro 12 to Nuendo 12 cross grade. Uh, leaves you does leave you with a Cubase Pro 12 license. I could check that out later. I haven't tried it. And, and he says the behaviors change from previous versions. So you might be able to still run your Cubase if needed. I haven't done the upgrade license yet. So. All right, so we see Rick France is saying, uh, hit the like button if you like these sessions. And he's doing it, so that's great. That enables us to continue to do these live streams. All right, so we see from Filter Freak, uh, hi Greg, uh, it says loving Cubase 12.02, very stable. I would go as far as to say best version yet for this 30 year old counting veteran user, so that's great. You see Mark Raven is out running errands today, but still joining us mobily. All right, so just seeing uh, from Vicente Vince Music, um, in the Steinberg Library Manager, the path in the program data folder of the libraries does not appear in the above tab. Uh, however, they are found by Cubase Pro 12. So I think when we go into the Library Manager, And let me just, the path in the program data folder. Um, all right, so as we kind of look at it here, we could see you know, the, the path here. So let me just see if I can understand this.
Okay, so it says uh, in the Steinberger library manager, the path in the program data folder of the libraries does not appear in the above tab. However, they are found by Cubase 12. So, you know, it, your content could be anywhere as long as you double click, then it could automatically be recognized by Cubase. Uh, so it doesn't have to be in a common folder, but let me know if I'm misunderstanding, which I think I am. All right, so we see from Soren, <clears throat> uh, I have activated uh, Cubase Pro 12 on two computers. For some reason, that is registered as on three computers, and now I have to activate it again on my PC, and I have no free activations. What can I do? So check um, when we come over here. So let's let's say if we go to, I think we go to, I think it's maybe account.steinberg.net. So when you come over, so go to account.steinberg.net, and then when you go into uh, your profile, at this you could see all of your Steinberg licensing products there. Um, so at that point, um, you know, you could see and it, it should show you kind of where, uh, you know, where that particular license is looking at there. So here you could look at uh, show Steinberg licensing based products and that will give you kind of a, a path to indicate which computers and then you could deactivate it on, you know, maybe it's installed somewhere else, or you could just simply uh, deactivate it on the Steinberg license manager on one temporarily and see. So, but that should give you an idea. See John Shaman just saying thanks for reminding us about the like button. He always forgets. He says, uh, "Hey Greg, can we post the button for at least four years?" So, all right. So we see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. So we see, and he's just asking if the Nam experience is great. So it's wonderful to see so many people. Uh, you know, it was a much smaller show. I think it was about 46,000 people as opposed to like, you know, 120,000 where it's been at kind of in the past. But it was, you know, smaller show, but easier to talk to people. And it was wonderful to catch up with so many industry friends, colleagues, and users. But if you had to miss one damn show, that would, would be an okay one to miss. But. Michael wants everyone to whack the like button. Um, all right, and we see from Soren, just, uh, how do I deactivate uh, one of the licenses? So if you go into your Steinberg activation manager, you could just deactivate it. So once you have it activated, you could you know dynamically activate, deactivate different um, different you know licenses on different sources. All right, so we see a uh, question. Uh, how do I master timing slash quantizing latency? I always have a problem with my tracks are lagging and have different timing. Uh, things trailing and not sharp. There is MIDI latency, etc. How do I go about that and fix that? Uh, I tend to waste a lot of time just to fix timing. So, you know, figure out uh, one, what's causing the latency. So latency is going to be caused by you know, of the buffer setting, as well as, you know, any processing that you have going on. So see if you go to Cubase here, and when we go to your studio setup, you know, we'll go to your audio interface, 
So check to see where this buffer is here. So you can say, okay, I want to run this at 192 buffer. So, you know, that will decrease the particular latency of your system. Now, if you add a number of plugins, so some people will crank their buffer down to get the latency up and then they have like a mastering chain on their master fader. And that mastering chain can have a lot of latency too. So realize that, you know, if you have a lot of effects going on in your mix console, so say we go to your mixer and we have, you know, four or five different effects going on here that each of those effects can be causing latency as well. So one way to bypass plugins that are causing latency is to just come over here and you'll see in the lower left-hand corner of the transport, this function called constrained delay compensation. So turn that on, enable that, and that will bypass plugins that are that are causing latency. So probably between those two. So a lot of people crank their buffer down thinking that the latency is lower and then they add latency during the mixing process or during having plugins open. So it's generally not instrument plugins that do this, but audio effects plugins like multiband compressors, look ahead processors, limiters, stuff like that. All of those can cause latency. So try to can do a constrained delay compensation uh, and see if that makes a difference and lower the buffer and see if that makes a difference. Uh, if you wanted to isolate it or you think oh, maybe, you know, one other thing that it could be is the actual USB MIDI interface driver uh, that could cause issues. And one way to test that is to just hit, uh, I think it's Alt or Option plus K. And instead of triggering using your MIDI controller, see if you have the same latency when you use kind of the software MIDI keyboard. And that's not using your USB MIDI driver. But between those three things, you should be able to isolate what's causing the latency for your MIDI. So everyone's happy that Michael Teams is now doing ice cream distribution. Always oh, a welcome addition to the live stream community. All right, so Michael Teams just indicating, uh, hi, Greg, I tracked with Pad Shop and deleted a piece of the track, yet it still plays. Uh, what do I need to do to stop playing back of deleted track? Um, okay, so if it is something like, let's say you, I'm not sure if you deleted the track or deleted an event, um, so let's say if we deleted a part like that in pad shot and you have the instrument that's still sounding after it's deleting. So if the note was stretched out, so let's say we had a note here that was really long and it was going on here and we cut this part here but we had a long note like a you know maybe a pad sound or strings that we're cutting so if I cut the event and erase the event that note can still be playing back depending upon a preference so sometimes if we go to editing I think under MIDI you'll see this this preference for split MIDI events so if we have, um, let's say, a long note here, I'm going to turn that off. All right, so let's say we have a long note that's going to last... All right, I'll just make this bigger so we can see it more obviously. All right, so I choose to cut this note without that preference turned on. That note will still sound 
all the way through. So as we're playing... So that note, you know, depending, could still continue on. So make sure you go to, again, Preferences and Editing MIDI and Split Note Events. Because now what happens is if I cut that particular event, now the note itself will end right at that particular moment. And when I delete that that note will hold to where we cut and then it will basically cut off right at that point and then delete. So try going to preferences, editing to MIDI and make sure that split MIDI events is enabled. And that will probably take care of it for you, Michael. All right, so we have Michael Romanowski from Coast Mastering. Got to catch up with him at NAMM for a bit, so it was wonderful to see you, Michael, as well. Michael is a featured speaker at the Dolby booth for Dolby Atmos work and workflows. All right, so it says, uh, I wish you can move or add the BPM clock. Uh, use two screens and it would be, I would like it on my second screen. So let's say if I come here and I'm just playing this. So let's go to more options. And we could go to time display. And I want to, this to be bars and beats. Then this is a floating window that you can move to any screen. So try going to studio, to more options, to time display, right click for the time format. And then that's a floating window that you could place uh, anywhere in your system. So if you want it to be, so give that a try if that's what you want to do. Just reading through comments. All right, so it just sees, uh, I see from Soren just with his activations, says I cannot run Cubase 12 on my PC now, activation limit reached, and I cannot deactivate two times on my PC. So if you're, you know, if you if you only have it on one single computer, one of the things that you could do is if you email Steinberg support, they can uh, remotely remove the other lice, the other activations for you. So maybe reach out to Steinberg support. I think that in Sweden it goes to it might go to directly to Germany. Um, but they could remotely deactivate your system to free up your activations. All right, just reading through comments. All right, so we see from uh, Oren Bynum, so great to see you on the live stream. Um, hi, Greg, using chord pads, please show how to 
bring in a MIDI example for guitars and how you set up the player in plain modes patterns, how you layer uh, the pianos per individual tracks. All right, so let's take a look. Great, so I'll just come over here to chord pads and let's say. All right, so now I just have, um, you know, various, uh, let's say I just wanted to come here. I have just chord tracks I'm triggering. So as normal, so let's say I now wanted to come to, so I have this layered with a guitar and let's say I want to do, let's look at a string. And let's look at another string part. So if I wanted to, layer these all together. Like, I'll just assign these all to the chord pads now. But let's say I wanted to go to the guitar part here. And as we go to the guitar part, I want it to, uh, let's go to the player mode. So I want to choose patterns. So at this point, um, I could just choose like for the guitar. So then you could just have kind of different patterns. And so at that point, when you go to the player modes, you could choose, you know, whether you want it to be sections where you can, you know, and I'm just gonna take these different MIDI notes here. and I could play. So these four notes will just, that we see here, are just gonna trigger the actual patterns. So if I switch chords. So at that point, you could choose whether you want it to, you know, be sections to be based on patterns. You could import MIDI loops or just drag and drop patterns as well. And, or if you want it to be just playing chords. Uh, so that's where you could do it. So again, to access that within the chord pads, just kind of click right here and edit. And then you'll see in the player modes where you can make those adjustments. All right, so we have a question. It says, if I click on an audio track, it opens in the uh, in window editor, but then, for example, to use the create warp markers from hit point function, I can't scroll down to the inspector window. I uh, hope this makes sense. English is not my native language. So, all right, so let's say uh, if we wanted to do the warping as described. So in Cubase 12, which uh, so you, we don't necessarily have to do it in the inspector. Um, 
But let's say if I wanted to Let's get this project open. Okay, so all right, so you know, if we're doing kind of our warping, you know, it, so let's say if we're here and let's say we have our uh, hit points set. And I'm just going to you know so if you want it to like let's say we have our hit points here so we're, we'll edit our hit points um so it could be that once you have the hit points here um so it just says um I can't scroll down in the inspector window I hope this makes sense um all right so if you just click here, you know, at this point we could take our warp markers. So let's say I want to take this and we'll adjust kind of our intensity. And if you wanted to make uh, the warp markers, you know, you could click right there. But another way of doing it is to, if we just go to your audio menu to real time processing. We could say create warp markers from hit points. So now when we switch to our warping tool and we'll zoom in, so we don't have to do it from the inspector, but as we zoom in now, we could just do kind of all of our hit point editing accordingly, like so. So you can still do it from the inspector window, but again, go. To, you could also access the same function by going to audio to uh to real-time processing and create the warp markers from hit points and do it on the project window as well and then as soon as we go come over here let's say if i'm in my audio warp and we have free warp selected then those hit points those warp markers that we created are automatically applied in the sample editor right there All right, uh, so I just see um, uh, what can I uh, what can I do if I just purchased Cubase 12, but the website doesn't show I purchased it. Uh, I got no license codes or downloads, but it charged my account. Um, so check to make sure the one that it um, that you you know sometimes when it comes in and make sure that it is the my Steinberg account. If it was like an update, um, but you know make sure that. You know, sometimes if people may have a different address for their My Steinberg account than what they're trying to access, check in your junk email folder as well. Sometimes it gets flagged as kind of like a junk email because it's coming from a company. Uh, but check those things. Um, and if you want to send your My Steinberg account information, I could probably send it over to support. And if you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de, I could pass it on to support and they could probably reach out to you and look for it. All right, so we see Uno Mementos of one, giving from Finland's giving a pint to everyone. So we appreciate that. All right, so I just see, just a comment. Um, it says, but when I move libraries to another SSD, they are not recognized. So, um, so I think this is going back to maybe our library manager question. So, if you go into the library manager at this point, you know, did I'm not sure if you just moved it through like uh, Explorer or Finder, or if you just came and selected the library and chose to move directly from here. So if you could let us know if you moved it from 
the library manager or if you just physically moved it using uh, Finder or Explorer, that would be helpful. And if you did manually move it, just double clicking on it, right clicking, um, then you should be able to uh, have that automatically associate with the program. Okay, so we see uh, from a question. Hi, Greg. When I open and play a project first time, there's a glitch every time any part play for the first time until the full is run. Uh, the, everything starts playing normally without glitch. Uh, what's going? <clears throat> so check, you know, just to make sure, you know, see if when you adjust the buffer size, you know, so if we select your audio interface, if you adjust the buffer size higher to see if that makes a difference, sounds like maybe some, you know, maybe some sample libraries, if it's a lot of sample libraries, maybe they're not all loaded, um, or, you know, the buffer size may be too low, and sometimes it may catch up after it's played through, but if you could check those things and let us know, that would be helpful. All right, so we see Pablo on the live stream. Wonderful to have the drummer of Hot Mess on the live stream, as long as, as well as one of the main writers and guitarists with Michael Teens. Okay, so we see uh, for the BPM clock, uh, it says I meant the BPM clock embedded so I can change uh, when needed. So I guess if maybe it's the transport that you need to see on a different screen. So maybe if you just hit F2 uh, and that will open up another transport. So if you need to edit uh, and you could also just go to the transport menu and go to transport panel and check that. And then this could be floated to any other screen and not just fixed to the bottom. So at that point, just simply drag that over to your second or third screen wherever you need to. So let me know if that works. See that Pablo has forgotten his last question. I'm sure we have time to get to it, hopefully. All right, so we see a uh, question, how to change mute record arm preferences when selecting a track. So if we come here, we could just, you know, as we select track, if I want it to uh, solo or, you know, record enable. So if you go to preferences and let's go to um, editing and then under project in mix console, we could say, uh, enable record on selected audio track. And I think if we go to and there's also like track selection. So if you come here, so you can enable record or enable solo on selected track. So if you wanted to come over here and hit OK, as soon as I select a particular track, we could have that. I don't think I have any inputs assigned here. So as soon as we come right over here, if there's an input assigned that you could just, at that point, uh, arm that track for record. So again, go to preferences, to editing, project and mix console, and this is enable record on selected audio, selected MIDI, or enable solo on selected track. So try that.
Hey, Jazz Dude, just reminding people to subscribe to the channel and hit the like button. All right, so we see Jeff Sabelski from Chico, California. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. And we see Cubase Junkie on, wishing everybody the greatest Cubase addiction. All right, we see Ted Springman on. Great to see you back. Missed you on some live streams. Okay, so you see, uh, so Ted's asked, I'm between two computers, need recommendation what CPU slash system uh, gives largest uh, VI count. I'm testing a Mac Pro 2019 Intel 24 core, managed to play 3,000 uh, and 72 stereo tracks at 4824. Um, so, um, so a lot of times it could depend on, you know, if you're going the Mac route, you know, make sure that your virtual instruments, if they are uh, native M1, that could help. It's still a bit of a transition period for a lot of third-party instruments. Um, but if you're doing 3,072 tracks at 4820, you know, at 24-bit 48K, you know, that should probably meet a lot of people's needs, you know, and at that point... Also, RAM, um, so as much RAM as you can get. There's probably always a new computer around the corner. You know, most composers, I just did a series of composer visits, um, you know, that are running really large systems, you know, still seem to be PC-oriented uh, because kind of scalability and being able to incrementally upgrade as needed. Um, but if you're... Doing that many tracks, maybe Jazz Dude could also give some share some insights as well. Okay, so we just see a uh, question: How can I configure a key on a keyboard to record audio in Cubase? Um, so I'm not sure if you want it to have a key record the audio or if you want it to record audio simultaneously with MIDI. So let's say if I want it to um, pop over here. So let's say if I have, um, so I have this virtual instrument. So if I wanted to record the that as MIDI and audio simultaneously, I could route this track um, to a group channel. And at this point, I can add uh, an audio track and route its input to the group. All right, so now I could, you know, record both of these. So let's say we'll send this to uh, my piano. And I'll just go ahead and let's solo just our audio track. So now as I record, that that keyboard is automatically set um, to record the audio from the virtual instruments. So if we route it through a group, we could do that. Um, if you want it to have a key on your MIDI controller, you know, set up to do record, um, you know, one easy way to do that is just to come over to like, you know, your studio, you know, your setup and let's go to generic remote and we could learn. So I'm just gonna hit um, I'm going to define my MIDI input and output. I 
then I could learn and I could say we want this to let's say go to transport Then just hit record. So now when I hit that MIDI key, it'll just automatically take it into record. So, so let me know if I misunderstood, but you could assign it via generic remote or the new MIDI remote system. Um, or just simply do that. But if you wanted to, you know, play a virtual instrument and record it to audio, route it to a group and set an audio track with the group as the input. All right, we see Gareth on, so just, just hoping that I had fun at NAM. So there's a lot of people who get to have fun. I, I have to work all the time, you know, so doing booths for like eight hours a day or so. But it was good to see a lot of great friends and colleagues at the show. All right, so we see uh, how can split uh, chord notes into tracks like violin track, violas, cellos, etc. All right, so okay, so I'm going to just generate a quick chord chart here. All right, so let's say if I just drag some chords quickly. Okay, so when we look at this, we'll have, let's say our chords. All right, so a lot of times what you could do is, uh, let's go to the logical editor. And we will just say, let's, uh, extract to track. And we will say, we want to do MIDI notes and the property is set to, let's see, it's not, it's not property. Let's do context variable, I think. Um, so here we could say <clears throat> uh, note number in chord <clears throat> or position in chord. And at this point we could say, okay, I want to do, uh, so we'll say our, I wanted to do like the, thirds of the chord I could just say okay come right over here and as we do this it'll automatically extract our different voices to chords so you could do the different voices um, so once again you could extract to track type is equal to note go to context to variable and you can set condition uh, and then you could choose Position in chord, note number in chord, like where zero is the root. One could be like the third, two could be the fifth, three the seventh, 
four, the ninth, etc. And then you could extract those voices to different tracks. So give that a try. Gareth wants everyone to hit the like button again. See Jazz Dude saying one week without Greg's Hangouts was hard, so we'll be back. So it's been more fun to do the to do all of the live streams, but it was nice to be out for a show. Chat field just jumped on me, so bear with me. Popolo is saying I'm a legend, legend, I think. So I just talk and push buttons and hopefully help people. Right, Gareth is saying Greg's bass wizardry could be heard on a new Hot Mess album. So yeah, we should go check it out. Everyone did a great job with all their parts in production, so I was just listening to it this morning. All right, so we see a question. Uh, Spectralayers 1 does not appear in Cubase 12 at the track level as an extension. What can happen? So there was an update to Spectralayers 1, which I think is uh, 8.02, uh, that was released with Cubase 12, so make sure that you have the newest version of Spectral Layers 1 as opposed to um, as opposed to like the version that came with Cubase 11. So make sure you do that, then it should show up. Okay, we see Gareth is sneaking out to get some food, probably for his family. Okay, um, so I just see, where is uh, German Greg Link, please, Cubase? Um, so if it's, you know, you could go to, I think, Steinberg.net, and it should be localized to uh, to German. It should be geolocated. Uh, so kind of let me know if there's a specific link, uh, and I might be able to enter it in the chat or something as well. See, Pablo is just saying Verve is a great piano sound. So, yeah, it was a wonderful instrument. Reading through comments.
Okay, just reading through more comments. Sorry, my chat field jumped on me. See, best green Jesus had questions, but he can't find the notepad where he wrote them in. So sometimes paper still works amazingly well for that, but you, I lose paper and virtual notes too. So. Um, so I just see a question. Uh, is there a plugin like, um, Record box. So I don't know what record box does, but maybe if you can tell us what the plugin does, uh, we could, there might be something to mimic it. All right, so a question from Paul Claridge. Uh, hello, Greg, is there a way to start and stop Groove Agent with a key command or a signed button uh, and not play with project? Uh, I like to let Groove Agent play while I'm testing out melodies, et cetera. All right, so let's see if we jump back to a different project. So let's say, um, all right, so let's take this and okay, so let's see if we can map this. particular key so let's get to our MIDI remote I'm moving magazine off my controller here sorry about that okay so let's see if I could get this to maybe play do the play function Groove agent through MIDI remote. Okay. See if I could do it through. All right, let me try just a generic remote. So I don't know if you could do it through like a MIDI, uh, through a MIDI message, but if you just kind of hit play in Groove Agent and 
let me see if there's let's see if there's maybe a Yeah, so it doesn't look like it's uh, dressable. Oh, maybe this. Okay, so it looks like maybe we could set it through. All right, so let me just look at the key commands here again. So you can assign a key command for it, but Groove Agent may have to be the active window. So if you come over here and go to uh, the instrument to options and come over to key commands and look under global to play, and then you could assign your own keyboard shortcut for play right there at any time. So, but let me see if I, And maybe even try through quick controls. Let's see if it's addressable here. Yeah, so you could assign a keyboard shortcut for just a transport. Sorry, it took a while for me to figure it out. So let me know if that'll work. All right, um, so we see how to enter full screen on Mac. So, you know, what I, you know, for doing this, I always just kind of maximize. Um, and I think it's just, this is part of a Mac OS where you could have the windows kind of drop down. So everything is just maximized. But if you go to your system properties, I think is where um, you could choose. I'm trying to remember what the preference was. But 
but I, I always have some people say, oh, you know, it's impossible. You know, it's like, how did you get Cubase to go full screen? And it's just like a, a Mac OS system preference. Let me see if I can. It's under. I think it's just kind of standard. But so let me know if this is uh, different. Like if this is what, you know, there's different definitions that people have for full screen. But when we hide the menus, that's just a function in, in the Mac OS. And if you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de, I could uh, find it for you. We see some moderation from Jazz Dude. Appreciate that. Okay, so we uh, just see, uh, hi, I'd left you an email during the NAMM show to hopefully cover on this live chat about writing expression and modulation. Uh, have you already covered that? So I haven't done that, but we'll do it right now. So um, and I think the question was, and I'll just, is about how to record uh, and automate uh, MIDI CC data into a particular track. And I'll just jump to the question to read it. All right, so I'll just. All right, so it says, uh, I think, uh, let's see, this might be the question. Uh, trying to write automation, uh, expression, modulation, breath, controlled by pressing play and using MIDI faders. Am I missing a step somewhere? I can't write, I can write in with the pencil tool, but can't play it in. What am I doing wrong? All right, so let's come over here and let's say I have a, just a sound here. Okay, so when we have our sound, and if I want it to, so I could, you know, as I record in, you know, I'm going to record just a modulation wheel and maybe expression and volume. So I'm just gonna hit record. So I'm moving my modulation wheel. And now I'm gonna move some of my faders here. So now that I've recorded that, um, so yeah, just moving it, so it's all captured into this one event. So when we want to look at our, we could see, okay, I have modulation, I have expression, and let's say main volume. So, uh, and I'll just make this taller. So now all of this information is within the actual part here so that we could see all of the MIDI parts um, and, and they'll just, again, just show up directly as MIDI data within the part. If you wanted to look at this now, 
You know, we could say, okay, I want it to look at my modulation data here. And we could see kind of the modulation and you could edit uh, accordingly directly there. Now, some people wanted to, uh, you know, to immediately show up as like almost audio automation. And if you wanted that, you could go directly to your CC automation setup and you could choose whether you want, you, you know, particular CCs to be recorded into the MIDI part or directly into automation data. So that's another choice there, but you know, you should be able to just record uh, directly in without any, and that way all of the MIDI CC data is within the particular event here. And you could just choose what, you know, so as I move this event, all of the CC data moves with the notes that easily. So let me know if that's helpful. Okay, just reading through comments. All right. See Michael Team still dispensing ice cream. Glad to see Sable Winters on the live stream. All right. And we have wonderful to see Grant Nicholas on. Reading through comments here. All right, great to see Jay from Connecticut. All right, uh, so we just see, um, hey Greg, is there an easy way for ducking an audio in combination with voice like constant fade in and fade out duration of two seconds uh, and minus 10 dB so I don't have to uh, duck every in mid out time? So, um, all right, so Wave Lab has a function for that, which is like really handy for like radio edits and voice stuff. So let's say if I wanted to do, um, We might be able to do something with uh, with Project Logical Editor. Let me see if I can. All 
So the, there, you know, there might be a way with Project Logical Editor to, let me see if I could select automation points here. But we might be able to, let's, Could, so I know that we could take this selection range and drop it. Yeah, I mean, you you know, you could just so there isn't an automatic function, but let me see if we can. I select this and let's go to the project logical editor. So I'll say media type is equal to automation. And we want to trim. Let's say minus 10. Okay, so let's say we come here and let me Let's say we'll just Yeah, so you know if we come here, I might be able to you know, like I could work on this for Saturday's live stream. But I might be able to, you know, just kind of drag that over and then maybe select that point and move it and move that automation point. Um, but I could play around with that, but you could do it like that. But Wave Lab has something specifically for that. And you could also set like side chaining compressors to do that with your attack and release as well. But I'll play around with it if you want to send me an email uh, to clubcubase at steinberg.de. I'll see if we can figure that out. All right, uh, so we see from uh, Jay from Connecticut, uh, is there a way to envelope follow the ADSR or more importantly uh, to me amplitude of the audio track and use its values to automate variables on another track? So what you could probably do is set a track. Um, let me just jump to our project here. Okay, so let's say if we want to take like our bass track here, I'm going to run an FX modulator plugin on it. 
So we'll come over here and let's set our FX modulator. And we can find this, and this is in Nuendo 12 and Cubase 12. Okay, so let's say I just wanted maybe to do um, let's say even a volume change here. And then once you go into the trigger, we could activate the trigger and we could put this into sidechain or MIDI. So let's say I wanted this to sidechain from a kick track. Just let's go check my side chain input. Try another modulation source here instead. But try coming over here and then you could have like kind of your different envelopes. And let's say we'll just But you should be able to kind of send, you know, one track and have that be the sidechain input. And then you could have all of your different effects here, all with kind of independent functions. Um, so, but that's all kind of controlled by the sidechainable track. So give that a shot. And I think you could do some very creative things and you could have six different sidechains for each one. All right, so we have Tiago from Brazil checking in. Says he missed the live streams last week. So, okay, so we see from uh, Real Raven. Uh, I'm just in song UR44 C on my uh, other PC as the M audio has died. Where can I download the drivers? So let's go take a quick look. I think if you just go to steinberg.net. So you see updates and downloads. So 
So this is for your 22C, your 24C, your 44C. Um, so just Google URC downloads, and then you could just download directly from there. I'll make sure it's the right one. Yeah, so that this driver will automatically kind of do the trick for you. So and just support to downloads hardware. Okay, so Gerald just pointed out, uh, says uh, to hide the menu bar in the Mac, go to System Preferences, so Dock and Menu Bar. Thank you, Gerald. So Dock and Menu Bar is the obvious choice. Sorry about that. And then you could um, Menu Bar automatically hide and show the Menu Bar right there. So thank you, Gerald, for alleviating my brain cramp making me smarter. And as you see uh, about the UR44C driver, there's no Steinberg Yamaha entry in the download manager. Yeah, so it's not necessary for drivers, but just for um, like the applications themselves. Chat jumped on me, sorry. Okay, so I think I'm back where I was. All right, uh, so we see how do you create thick sounds from a mono output synth like the sequential Prophet 510? Um, Um, you know, so it's really, you know, so some people, you know, when they long for kind of the sound of analog synthesis or is that it's, you know, kind of, you know, j just that the outputs can, you know, sometimes, you know, we see this with a lot of contemporary workstations where, you know, a lot of synth workstations, they kind of hype the outputs, they add like a little bit of treble and bass uh, almost like an EQ circuit on the output stage. So, you know, but for doing stuff like that, you know, often if you have a mono output synth, you know, what you want to do to make it thicker is, you know, people, you know, EQ, compression, and, you know, various forms of distortion as well can make a big difference with that. Um, but a lot of times you may not need to kind of in context of a mix, but you know, those are things that I would do to kind of thicken up uh, a particular sound from a synth. All right, um, so we see, hey, uh, joining in from Nairobi question, uh, follow up on the MIDI CC data. Can I extract, say, MIDI CC1 data and set it as automation for a quick control on that channel? Um, so let's say if we have CC1 data, so let's say if I come here and I'll just add an instrument quickly. All right, so let's say I'll just go ahead and record a couple of notes and with some CC data. Right. 
right, so we'll look at my lovely composition here. So let's say I wanted to extract those CC. Um, all right, so let's come into our CC data here. So let's say we'll go to our modulation. Right, so copy and generally like quick controls are going to, so say if I wanted to go to quick control one, so let's say if I just automate this, all right, so I just have that data there, but let's say I now want to, you know, copy. So let's see if, if we copied this CC data here. And we go to this lane. And just change one automation function. So that's, let me try to, turn off auto select controllers and see if we, so it's, now let's say if I come, let's change my CC automation setup and let's say I want this to be written to an automation track. So now when I come back, I, let me just delete all of my CC data here. So now that we've kind of written this as automation, Now I could take that automation data, copy, and let's go to our track here and paste. So you could do, you know, if you write the CC data as automation, then you could copy and paste it to other tracks. But if it's written as MIDI data coupled into part, um, it doesn't seem like it could be, it'd be as easily copied, but so just try writing it as automation and then you could copy it to a quick control parameter. All right, so we have uh, Diamond District Studios. Uh, how do you quantize all audio clips uh, of the song at once? So all you have to do, let's say if we come over here uh, and I wanted to select all of the audio events and we'll zoom in just so we can see. Uh, so now I could just set my quantize value here to eighth notes and I'll go to my quantize panel and make sure that audio warp is enabled and then you could just quantize and you can see all the parts will be quantized just like that so as soon as you come here So whatever is selected will be quantized. So if you have multiple events selected or a single event selected. All 
All right, so we see, uh, are there any notable feature updates to WaveLab version 11.1? So there's a number of different, um, you know, you know, like maintenance things, but, you know, one of the biggest things is, you know, now – uh, if you ha if you're just buying 11.1, that it could run on the new Steinberg licensing scheme, and in a couple of weeks, uh, it should be able to existing WaveLab 11.1 customers should be able to update to the new Steinberg licensing system from the e licensor. So that's a pretty big deal for a lot of people. Just reading through comments. Sorry. All right. So I just see from Mark Hollins, as I know what I'm looking for, can be done because I've seen Mark Giovanni do it, but did not show setup side of it. Basically, to play an ensemble part with two hands and played fader parts in. So, you know, if, it, if they're just transmitting MIDI CCs, any of the faders can automatically just be recorded in the same part. So I think, you know. We may have shown that a little bit earlier, but let me know if it still doesn't, if that's not what you're asking about. All right, so we see uh, feature request, very audio question, pitch correct using the reference of another track, option one using a MIDI file, and correct a uh, voice using very audio. So, you know, if we are doing that, I'll just open up a different project. So you can kind of do that already with a MIDI reference file if you're not aware. Uh, let me find a good example. Just open one up here. Sorry about that, that I had it open recently. All right, so let's say if we want to uh, come over here, let's say we're, we're doing very audio on our vocal part. I'll make this larger, so. All right, so at this point, we can see uh, no MIDI reference, but if I wanted to see the piano part, we could see that the MIDI reference part underneath it. So at that point, we could just see the MIDI reference. So that way we could use a MIDI file, and then you could, it doesn't automatically snap to it, but you could kind of do it with scale correction, so you could see what notes are within the chord. So once again, you just go to uh, MIDI reference right here, and then you could see a MIDI part underlying. Okay. 
And we see option two in very audio and already corrected voice as a reference for correction for other voices, uh, sopranos, etc. So yeah, it'd be nice to be able to kind of do very audio across multiple like stacked vocals, but sometimes each of those vocals um, could be slightly off as well. So. All right, so we see uh, from Youngstar Prod. Uh, hey, all new customer here. Um, is there a way slash feature of a precise automation editor, kind of like the crossfade editor in a new window? Um, so, you know, most times the automation is pretty easy to do kind of in the same. So let's say if we wanted to take You know, if we had automation going on here. All right, so say we had automation. You know, there's a lot of tricks that sometimes people, like if we have a selected range of automation, you know, if we wanted to come over here and kind of tighten or expand the automation, or if you wanted to bring it up or down, uh, if you wanted to come over here and tilt from the start or tilt from the end. You could do all these things and, you know, very easy to, you know, if we wanted to take even a range of automation to bring up or down, we could select just that particular range. If we wanted to do curves uh, between two points, we could edit curves. So if I just want to take this, move that, we could adjust the curves between uh, two points, you know, so there's lots of really, you know, very fluid automation editing, but if there's a particular function um, that you feel that you can't guess, get to, um, let me know, and you know, maybe we could show you how to get there if it's not obvious. All right, wonderful to see Graham Witcher on the live stream. Thanks for joining us. And Cubase Junkie saying the multi tap delays is favorite plugin in Cubase 11. So that was a great one. Yeah, if you want to uh, just see a comment about the side chain ducking. So I'll see if I could work on like maybe a macro. I might be able to. Uh, create a macro or a project logical editor, but just send me a quick um, send me a quick email reminder to Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. I think my chat field just jumped, so let me. So I think I'm back where in the same neighborhood. All right, we see Real Raven 2000 found the UR44C driver, so that's great. Um. All right, so we see from Jay, it says, apologies, uh, So he's, and just about the ducking, but is attempting to trace raw curves from amplitude, attack, other audio qualities, and directly translate to automation in another track. So there's not really anything I know that kind of does that. Um, you know, there might be some third-party tools or plugins that will allow you to do that, um, but I don't have anything directly in Cubase that would do that to my knowledge. All right, so we just see a question from Dallas LaRue. Great, glad that you could join us today. Um, so are the harmony voices in Cubase 12, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass diatonic harmonies? 
Uh, I'm trying to get a better understanding of harmonies. So when we come over here, you know, we, we could change kind of the harmony. Let's say I'm going to create a chord track based on the scale here. So I'm going to go to my project window and I'm going to uh, go to the chord track and we'll create chord events from the MIDI data. So now when we create, so when we have our chord track, we know what the basis is. Now I could select a range and as we do this range and let's get to audio menu and let's generate harmonies generate harmony voices I'll just choose four so as we do this it's going to give you a soprano alto tenor bass so they will be you know I guess diatonic because it's going to fit within the scale of what you just created but if you want it to change uh, the voicings, you know, as we, um, you know, go to the particular chord track here, you know, we could choose for this to be, you know, if you wanted two altos, you know, you have, you know, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and again, it's going to fit within the chords, but you also have alternate uh, notes for each of those voices as well. So, uh, so if diatonic, I, I think that would mean within the scale. Uh, so once the chord track has been defined, then it will create those based, you know, within the scale. All right, so we see Mark Rabin just popping in for a second. All right, so we see Sable Winters has a new Ryzen 9 computer coming tomorrow. Congratulations, hope it works out well for you. All right, so just see from uh, the Turtle Project says, I'm trying to create a loop pack with the mind to sell it online. Every time I export said loops, uh, they have 20 milliseconds of silence at the start, making them impossible uh, to loop when imported. Um, anyone know why? So let me just jump back to our project. So I'm not sure if you're exporting it via, um, you know, the project mix down or if you're doing it on using uh, render in place but let me just jump back to here all right so I'll just take a couple of different um, loops quickly and copy them over All right, so let's say I have a series of loops here. Um, so I'm going to select these events and let's go to render in place. And I want these as separate events. Um, and we'll keep the source events unchanged. All right, and let's go ahead and we'll play these together both Tracks will solo. All right, let's go to the next one. And let's look at the rendered file and we'll kind of just zoom in here a bit.
So there it looks dead on together. So no problem there at the beginning. Let's look at the beginning of this file. So these all look kind of identical to me. And as we listen to it, it sounds identical. So if you could let me know if you're doing it with the export audio mix down, you know, there's also in Cubase 12 where we could do our export it uh, selected events. So let's say if I come here, I'll select these events. So we'll export selected events and So, so if you, you know, this we could import separately, but you know, it's basically the same process as the render in place. So let, let me know how you're doing it, but the render in place seemed to work as expected. See, Graham Witcher is asking for a soup recipe from Michael Pierce, even if it might be warm. All right, uh, so just see, uh, hi everyone. I've been having trouble with plugin windows, uh, always opening in another screen, which isn't the one where Cubase is open, and also with external VST plugins not redimensioning correctly. Um, so I think it's going to be, you know, check to see if, you know, you know, if you're not, if you have like multiple screens and you don't have Cubase, you know, maybe if you make the one with Cubase the primary screen. But let me just I'll do a quick test here. I think it may just kind of open up. So it's a. Okay, so let's say if I move this plug into this position and close it. Now it's going to immediately go back to its position where it was when it was open. So if I open and close plugins accordingly, it just kind of opens to their last position. We open a new plugin. Um, so say we go here. So, you know, make, make sure if you have multiple screens that maybe if you set Cubase to be your primary screen, that you know the plugins might open on a primary screen. So if you have Cubase on the secondary screen, maybe the plugins are going to your primary screen, and maybe you could change that easily. All right, so we see uh, I've been waiting on a maintenance update to fix the Groove Agent crash issue I've discussed before. Support told me that it is coming. So yeah, I think you'll you know look into the next couple days, next day or so, maybe tomorrow, who knows. Um, but yeah, so there's an update that's coming. See, Graham Witcher is asking Michael Teams how the new Hot Mess album is coming. So I think you get actually it's released, and I think it's available to listen to on Bandcamp. So check it out. All right, so we see, uh, does Cubase work with Dolby Atmos Render uh, or so? Is there any tutorial about it? Thanks. So yeah, we, we have it built in. So let's come over, um, I'll just switch to a different project here. Because uh, you need to be at 48K just as you do this. So 
and you need to set the buffer size to 512 samples. So come over here, I'm going to switch sample rates. And so I'm just going to check the buffer size of my interface because I don't think it's at 512. Okay, so to kind of start with the Dolby Atmos project, go to Project and go to ADM Authoring for Dolby Atmos. Uh, and then there's a Setup Assistant, which will make this much faster. So we can say, okay, we want our main mix configuration to be 714. We'll add a bed for everything to kind of hang out in, give it a home. Uh, and then we could choose to render if you don't have a 714 monitoring environment, you could just choose, choose to render binaurally over headphones. And that's, and now as we go to particular tracks, we could open it up here and we go to the inspector. We can now just go to the panner and if we're, and we could pan to get our height or our front to rear perspective. So that's really all you have to do. And then once you're done with everything at that point, you could again, go to your ADM authoring. And then when you need to export an ADM file, all you have to do is just come right here and you could export ADM file. Just reading through more comments. Thanks for all the great questions. And if, if you do learn anything new, make sure you do hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. So I see just a request to have pictures on, I guess, your MP3 tracks. Through more comments. We appreciate Jazz Dude doing his moderation. So let me just. Still reading through comments.
I'm still reading through comments here. All right, so we see a uh, question from Jay. Uh, you showed me how to extract MIDI from Vario Audio to another track. Uh, love it, super helpful. However, is it possible to use Vario Audio in, uh, to extract highlighted Vario Audio portions to another track? So I think it's gonna be everything that's in the Vario Audio, but if you want it to just, you know, let's say if I had just a portion of the Vario Audio, I could, just come here like if i wanted just to take a like you know just a couple or little section i could select it with a range tool and just do the um let's go to audio to bounce selection and then you could replace and double click and that way it's only going to be a file that's going to be this big and then at that point we could do the very audio just you know if you wanted to just extract just a few notes you could just you know so just try selecting it uh do a bounce selection and then at that point uh do very audio just on that and extract the midi from there All right, so we just see a uh, question. Hello, please tell me a solution for MIDI hold holds note forever issue. Um, so if you ever have like a, like a stuck MIDI note, um, you could just come over here to go to MIDI and from the MIDI menu, click reset. And that will send a kind of like a, a massive note, notes off message. So give that a shot. All right, so we have a question. Uh, can you auto chop uh, a sample with the sampler track and drag MIDI notes to trigger the event? So yes. Um, so let's come over here. So let's say if I have uh, a particular audio track here, um, and let's say I'm just gonna add a sampler track. So I'm just gonna drag the audio to the sampler track, and then we go to slice. So, and when we go to slice the audio, so it's just, and at this point now, it's automatically just taken our drum loop and created slices. And if we wanted to drag this into the project, we see this little, um, this little MIDI icon here. We could just drag and drop that and that will make a MIDI file, but once we have it sliced, you can now just play uh, your auto-chopped sample. So Jazz Dude says we need one more like to get a hundred. All right, we see that Mark Rabin's dog Stella is is jamming on it.
All right, so we see from uh, Cubase Drunky says, I'm waiting on Steinberg to create a nylon guitar. They already have the best steel strings, which is the T guitar and M guitar. All they need is nylon and they got the total package. Yeah, so that's actually done by, you know, a different company. It's, you know, we sell and distribute the project on the Hallian platform. Uh, but you, you could write the company themselves. Um, I forget the name off the top of my head of the company. Uh, but it's not, while we kind of sell it and distribute it, it's not developed by Steinberg other than we're kind of the playback engine for it. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how does one split a stereo track in the project window to two mono tracks? So let's say if I wanted to take um, like these tracks, I wanna take this track that's a stereo track uh, and convert it to two monos. We select the track. Let's go to your project. And you'll see convert tracks and you can say uh, multi-channel to mono. And then that's all you have to do. So now we have our left and right tracks directly there. So select the track, not make sure it's not the event, but the track itself. And then go to project to convert tracks, multi-channel to mono or multi-mono to, or yeah, multi-mono, mono to, yeah, multi-channel as well. You can do the opposite. All right, so we see a uh, question. Uh, instrument volume fader keeps lowering volume by its own in the mixer console. How do I stop this? Um, so it could be either automation that's going on. So, you know, you may have, like for audio tracks, we often have module, you know, we may have uh, automation that occurs. So it's like, okay, I'm here and I just want to now kind of just tilt and, you know, you could have automation that's going on so that fader if we watch the fader on that particular track, you know, we'll see that the fader itself will just kind of fade out. Now, if it's with MIDI information, what's kind of what may happen is uh, if you don't see automation going on and it's a sampler, uh, like an instrument track or a. Um, you know, or a MIDI track, what you could do is come to the controllers and this will often say velocity. And then you could just see if you go to main volume. So you may have just uh, like MIDI CC data and that could cause the sampler track to automatically go down in volume automatically. And you may not see, you know, like why is it changing? Why is it doing that? And, you know, as you look at the MIDI CC7 at that point, it may not be as obvious. So look to see if you have automation. So you could just click directly in the lower left-hand corner to see if it's automation or within a MIDI event, switch from velocity here to main volume and you'll probably see uh, the different volume changes here, so that's probably where it's going to be found. Read through comments. Okay. 
We see that Cubase Junkie doesn't like 12 string guitars. Okay, so we see um, from Jeff Sabelski says Greg projects all 16 bit 44.1K from Composer recording session with. Pro Cellist last week was incredible. One day set up, 10 projects recorded, same bit sample. Cellist gave me kudos as sound engineer. That's wonderful. Congratulations. It's nice when a lot of preparation pays off. I know you've been working on this project for a long time, so can't wait to hear it. Okay, so we see uh, from the Turtle Project about the rendering. So let's say uh, thanks for the answer regarding loops. I was rendering in place, but from VST Instruments, not audio. Okay, so let's try some VST Instruments as well. So I'll do a quick uh, groove agent. Okay, so let's say I want to take those four sources. And let's go ahead and render these. Okay, so let's look. So kind of zooming in here. And I'll just play the rendered file here. And let's solo both. So when we look at these files, doesn't look like there's 20 milliseconds of silence here. Um, so let me know if it's like a particular instrument that you're noticing this with, or if it's every instrument, that would be uh, helpful, but it seems like it's kind of working as expected here. All right, so we have Yadin McKelly checking in. Thanks for joining us today. All right, so just see a uh, question. Uh, will Nuendo Cubase receive paragraph font patches from the Dorico 4.1 update? Uh, so I haven't heard, but um, we could check when it's released. Um, but I, I haven't heard of that, if that would happen or not.
Okay. Um, hello. Uh, is this question? Um, is there a way to write four part harmony and adapting automatically the voice leading? Um, so, you know, I don't know if there's a way you know, to automatically kind of do voice leading with four part harmony. I mean, Cubase will capture kind of whatever you put into it. Um, but there, I don't think there's any specific things for voice leading, but, you know, being able to see it easily and be able to edit multiple parts, like in a key editor, it can, you know, you can visualize it very easily. Okay, so I just see, Greg, I tried three times to change project to 24-bit 48K from pool and project setup. The sample rate changed, but not the bit rate. I had to change the projects uh, cir circuitously, and that took time. So, you know, generally you could always run, you know, the, the project's going to have a common sample rate, but you could choose to, you know, but you could have a 16-bit, a 24-bit, a 32-bit, or a 64-bit floating point file all within the same project. So that's generally why, you know, you could change it in the project setup to record in 16-bit, but, you know, but Cubase can handle multiple bit depths, but, you know, one common sample rate. See, uh, I just see from Cubase Junkie, if Greg comes to Texas, he'll love it here and not go back home. So I, yeah, I do like Texas. And I've had wonderful times in, you know, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, and my brother lives in Houston. So, but I like where I live now in Alexandria, Virginia. So I feel very lucky that I could live where I do. But I miss going, going to Texas, and hopefully I'll get to see my brother at his house and visit with him and his family. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Musical Moments. Uh, I'm only using Cubase to record VST instruments. I have my MIDI keyboard plugged into a USB port. Uh, will an external audio interface improve latency in any way? So generally, the external audio interfaces will have much lower latency than onboard audio interfaces, uh, especially on the Windows side. The Mac side, you can get lower latency. Um, you can get lower latency with uh, the built-in audio, but it's not the most robust compared to an, uh, a dedicated external audio interface or dedicated audio interface. So generally, you can run much smaller latencies and smaller buffers more robustly using a dedicated audio interface. Chatfield jumped on me. All right, so we have a question. Uh, can you automatically generate the MIDI notes to trigger the slices of sample in the sampler track? So, yeah, as we showed, um, you know, as we come to a sampler track, so let's say, I'll add a new sampler track here. So as we drag the audio into the sampler track and we create the slices, we'll turn that on. Now when we drag this out, it will automatically create the MIDI notes to trigger those particular samples based on the transients. Or, and you could choose different algorithms for the sampler track if you want it to.
reading through comments. Okay, so we see from Dallas LaRue, uh, I have a I have a lot of plugins in my systems that don't work because I don't have a license for these plugins. Is there a way to delete plugins from your system? So generally they're gonna be installed into a common VST plugin, like VST3 plugins will be installed into a common folder so that you could easily remove those and you could see the location, I think, if you go to the VST plugin manager. Um, so you could see that when you go to the path that you could find the path for the p particular plugins some plugin some third party plugin companies will allow you to simply uninstall some you just remove the like on windows you can remove the .dll file or remove the plugins from the uh, from the plugin folder manually yeah, um, so some will allow you to uninstall some companies you just remove the actual .dll file and that should take care of it for you. So we see Jeff Sabelski just mentioning, got an incredible sound using Nuendo to record a, record a professional cellist who complimented me as a sound engineer many times. I hardly said a word and was ready every second. Uh, I thank the CC121 and me, so that's great. I'm glad everything went well. I think it's always great, if, especially working with classical musicians, if you understand and can talk their nomenclature and their language and terminology, they appreciate that as well. But congratulations, can't wait to hear the project. All right. Um, so just seeing kind of like sporadic comments from uh, DJ FK. Um, but maybe if you have just like where it's one word per, um, per comment and it's kind of spread out. So, but if you have a, a full question, just type in a full question to a single comment and I don't have to kind of scroll back to try to figure it out. All right. Wonderful to see Randy Lee in the live stream. All right, so we see a uh, question from Jess Sabelski. Uh, Greg, so then if I got an incredible cello recording at 16-bit 44.1K and I changed the project to 24-bit 48K, will it sound even better using Nuendo? So, you know, it, you're not really going to get a lot of, you know, it's not going to really change the quality of the recording, you know. So there's plenty of great 16-bit 44.1 recordings around. Uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot of great sounding CDs out, but, you know, anytime it's not necessarily, you know, the capture format, you could capture more information with a 24 bit file. But, you know, if you're happy with and the client and the musician are all happy with 16 bit 44.1. Great. You know, there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing that but you know realize that when you record like a 16-bit 44.1 as soon as you modify the signal in any way such as you know adding any eq you add you know one one thousandth of a db of gain at that point it transitions from playing back in a 16-bit format to a 32-bit float because it's then entered into the mix engine so once it's in that then it can accommodate you know, more information in the mix engine so that it's not having to truncate the original file to add the new information in. 
So switching it to, you know, 24 bit the project to 24 bit or 32 bit won't really make a difference because the program is always running in 30. The engine is always running in 32 bit floating point or you could even set it to 64 bit floating point by default. So hope that makes sense. Reading through comments. All right, so we're just seeing uh, this might be going back to our previous track. There's no automation added and the volume level is not clipping. So, you know, if it's an audio track, I thought it was a MIDI track, but if it's an audio track, make sure it's not being routed to a bus or to another output, and that output is has its automation uh, going down, or there's automation on that track. So you might not see it on the source track, but if, it, if that track is being fed to a group and a group is has automation on it, then that could affect it as well. Michael Teams broke the cardinal rule of mentioning coffee in a live stream with about 30, about 45 minutes left. So. Um, so we see, uh, so, uh, question about very audio. There's a vocalist with guitar on a single audio file. She's singing at a higher octave than guitar. I'm wondering if very audio can extract the lower vocals to other track. Um, so, you know, very audio isn't really intended for that. You know, I mean, you could, it depends if there's a lot of bleed through, you know, so if it's like if you hear the guitar is equally as loud as the vocals, you know, it may not be able to do the very audio because as you tune the vocals, the guitar that was in tune is now out of tune. Uh, if you adjust a vocal at the, that's going on at the same time, but there isn't like a, you know, filter, you know, do very audio below these notes and turn it into MIDI. Okay, so I just see a uh, question from Dallas LaRue. I have an error message when I start Cubase, uh, e-license, control area, error not registered. It opens up after I close it, but uh, I still don't like getting the error messages. So try reinstalling the e-licenser. Sometimes after like a Windows update, you may have to just kind of reinstall the e-licenser and try that and that will probably take care of it for you. Still reading through comments. Thanks for all the great questions. All right. Okay, so we see uh, Cubase and Dolby Atmos. Uh, any tutorial available? So there, there is one. I think Dom Segalis did one, and we just kind of went through it a couple minutes ago. But yeah, if you look on the Steinberg channel when 12.01 came out. When I say coffee, now I'm yawning because I'm still a little jet lagged from Nam. 
All right, it's going through comments here. So thanks for all the great questions. All right, we see Graham Witcher has hit the like button, so that's great. Still reading through comments. Still reading through comments about some bit resolutions on recordings. Still reading through comments. All right, so I see a question. Uh, could you use logical editor to create interesting variations on a loop or break up MIDI notes within a sliced sample? So yeah, if you have Just do a quick sampler track. Project here, let me just. All right, so let's say we have our empty sampler track here. And I want to take this loop and we'll drag it to the sampler track. Let's go ahead and slice. And I'm going to drag these slices up here. So let's say if I wanted some variations of this, you know, we could have our drum loop play. So as we listen to, let's say, our original drum loop. So, you know, you could do things in a logical editor. Like, okay, I want to take this and let's take our MIDI notes and Let's say our pitch and let's mirror the MIDI notes. Let's 
may not be lined up, but if we wanted to, you know, let's say, we, you know, things we want to do to value one, you know, but there's also, you know, so you could do like randomizing. So let's say uh, value one set to random values between We'll just check the pitches here. Let's say C2, C3, and so let's say C3. And F4. So you could do stuff like that. Now you could also just, you know, some more accessible functions. If you come here to MIDI, then go to functions, you know, we could say I want it to uh, reverse the notes. I want it to come here. And from this event, let's, from functions, uh, mirror notes. So now we could kind of just take that one drum loop and as we come over here, solo it. And you could also just kind of randomly come here and just using my arrow keys. So now as I play this back, So all sorts of great little variations that you could do uh, using like the MIDI functions menu or using the uh, logical editor. All right, so we see just a question. Um, thanks, I don't get it though about the lower latency audio interfaces connected by USB. They're not using PCI Express. So how can they be so much faster than the onboard processors? It's really just that the onboard processors don't really have the like a, a audio driver that's capable of super low latency, which is why Steinberg invented ASIO, so that we can just simply have access to low latency functionality because like on, especially in a Windows platform, they're not really intended to work in low latency mode. It's not a critical thing. And even Microsoft will tell you for a DAW just to use ASIO. And we see, uh, doesn't the USB input output cause a bottleneck no matter how fast the processor and the external interface is? So it is, but you know they transmit you know information incredibly fast. Um, and again, it's really the driver as opposed to what physical format is interfacing with it. Okay, we see Michael Pierce has to check out, so. Great to see you, and hopefully we'll see you on Saturday. All right, so we see, uh, how do I have my MPE note expression return to neutral to before like the automation virgin space? Okay, so let's say if we. Okay, 
Okay, so let's say if I just want to Let's see if there's just a way to see the value. Let me just blow this up. So let me see if there's a way to have it snap. Or to see the value. Um, so I think that what you have to do is maybe if you adjust the value here in the info line to 64. So, you know, if you say, okay, you want that to return, so just maybe set it in the info line to 64 for the value. So you give that a try, but I don't think that there's a way to snap it uh, directly to the particular uh, default value, but I could do some reading up on it if you wanna email me. Reading through comments. All right, so we have a question from Benny. Um, it says, maybe a stupid question. What to do if I want to export just MIDI without sound? So obviously, you know, MIDI doesn't include the sound. But if you wanted to just export the MIDI, you know, just come over to File, and then you could export and just choose MIDI File. You know, that's all you have to do. Reading through more comments. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I have a live recording with a heavy handed sound engineer so that every song needs a different EQ. Is there a way of setting this up in a different project, if that makes sense? Um, so you could, um, you know, there's a couple ways of doing it. So if you have to, and just make sure. Okay, so I guess it was the the live engineers maybe EQing things differently. Um, you know, so what I would do is probably, you, you know, you could automate the EQs if you wanted to uh, for each of the tracks. Um, you know, some people will, you know, probably you could take each track to a you know, each track in a song to different tracks. So let's say if we're doing a live thing, um, 
and just jump to this project here. Okay, so if we were doing a typical live thing, you know, maybe if you take, let's say, all of the songs in your particular project here, and we move these to a new folder, um, that, you know, you could just come over here and, you know, maybe if we duplicate, let's say we had it look something But you know, if, if each song was in its own folder, then you could, you know, often kind of have, you know, the different EQs applied to the different tracks, or, you know, if everything is gonna be consistent, which may make more sense, um, you know, you could have everything kind of just laid out for you, kind of let's say graphically here. So let's say, okay, I want this is song to uh, and then you could just automate the EQ changes or you could take each of these and put these into their own separate folder. Um, and then if you have the same kind of sends, you could just kind of duplicate that way. But depending how extreme the EQs are, you know, you might just simply just, you know, automate the EQs uh, if it's pretty drastic between them. So just see, I wonder why YouTube slash Google doesn't have coders to solve this problem of the spammers. So probably because they make money from the spammers. So. All right, so we see, uh, when will Cubase allow users uh, on Cubase artists to route effects tracks directly to any mix bus? So I think it, it the only time that it prevents you from, you know, like creative routing is if it's gonna create a feedback loop. So, but generally you could, you know, if I add an effects channel here, Just activate this project. All right, so now I could probably duplicate the folders. All right, so, um, all right. So if I, if we have an effects track here, And let's say I want to add a group folder. Okay, so now that we have this effect, you know, we go to the sends here and then we could send it to each of the groups. Um, so, you know, we could you know, do it pretty easily, but I think the only restriction is, is is if it prevents a feedback loop, which is probably a good thing. All right, so we just see, uh, would there be a ping feature to automatically determine the latency of an external instrument as you can with external hardware effects? 
So generally, you know, Cubase knows when it's sending the MIDI information out to it. Um, and, you know, why there's an external ping for that is, you know, because a lot of processors do take, uh, you know, time to actually affect the signal, whereas instruments are designed to be more instantaneous with that. So, you know, they kind of, and since it's not being processed, it's generally, you know, there's no ping that's actually needed. Just reading through more comments. I know we had some questions that were sent in, so let me jump to some of those questions. Okay, so it just says, uh, hi, Greg, I need your support, please, sorting the below matter. Uh, while recording, I get a notification, audio dropout detected, and the lanes are repeated multiple times. Um, so generally what I would do, it, you know, sometimes when that happens, it, it could be the folder that's being uh, trying to be written to might be set to read only and not read and write. So check, you know, try changing the folder that you're recording audio to. And you can do a quick test just by selecting the particular folder here, right clicking and then choosing um, you could set a new record folder. So we come over here so you could set record folder to a different location and see if that helps and that will probably alleviate the problem so we see it sometimes when people copy something from like a cd rom or dvd uh, in the older days that those were set to read only to copy it over to the hard disk and it was only the folder was translated to read only instead of read and write so check that out and give that a shot All right, so we see um, about a question about tempo detection, um, and they had sent a file, so let me open up that particular file. And we're wondering how to do kind of the tempo detection on this. So I'll start with no file here, so let me activate the project. Right, so let's say we have, a, and I'll just come over here, let's say to do new versions. So let's say we have no. All right, so we want to do just a quick tempo detection of that file. So let's say I'm going to we will just select the guitar part. So let's go to our project and let's do a quick tempo detection. So we'll just come right over here and we'll analyze it. Okay, so I'll smooth tempo detection and we'll go ahead and listen to it. And I'll turn my metronome on. Okay, so let's try multiply by three, four. All right, now let me try multiply by four, three. Just see if I can do tempo detection. Hang on one second, my son's knocking.
All right, sorry about that. All right, so say, So when I was playing with this file earlier, I did one of the multiply by maybe by four, three. There, so. So since this is more kind of like a, almost like a six, eight, 12, eight kind of thing. So try to experiment with the multiply by four, three and the offbeat correction. I think that you can be in pretty good shape with that. All right, so we had a question. Uh, every time I tried to change the sample rate from 96K down to 48K, uh, my Apple M1 goes to rainbow wheel of death and freezes, which forces me to force quick, Cubase Pro 12 and reboot, but I really need to downsize the sample rate in order to free up CPU power and stop the performance bar from glitching whilst I uh, try to play the play the track. Any idea what might be happening and how to fix this? You know, so generally, like you know, if you have audio files as well, just kind of switching it from 96k to 48k. Um, you know, you'll have to do, you know, if you try maybe starting the process off by going to the project setup and maybe changing, you know, so I'm not sure how you're changing the sample rate. If you are using the built-in audio of the Mac, I think that it doesn't, you know, it's like it either doesn't do 44, like the headphone output if you connect headphones, it cuts off like it doesn't do 44.1 or 48K. So in, when you connect a headphone out or a headphone connection into like my Mac, I don't think it does 48K. So I think it only does 44.1, but it will do 96K, which is strange. So I think connect, if you physically connect a headphone into the headphone jack, that that can limit your sample rate options. So, but if you come over here and just choose to, uh, you know, change your sample rate for the project and hit OK, um, then you should be fine. But, you know, check to make sure all of your audio files and if your audio interface, if you have an audio interface, if it is choosing to, if you're clocking externally, then it may not switch for you and that could cause all sorts of problems. But it could be that, you know, depending on your audio interface, if you're using the built-in audio, um, that it's not going to support 48K if headphones are connected. So try that. Okay, so we have a uh, question. I have issues with the status bar in Cubase 12.02 in previous versions on PC. For some reason, the status bar always reappears. And he sent a video, so let's see if we could create this. So I'm just going to drag a loop over. Okay, so as we do this, let's go to our status line. So we select this, we can see the status line. Okay. So we'll Turn that off here, so save. Okay, so we look at this and 
Again, our status line is off. I'm going to close this project. So it looks like it may have re-enabled. So yeah, it does look like it re-enables itself, um, which maybe if we saved as a template, let's see if we save it as a template, it might be kind of a global setting, but let's, So let's see. Yeah, so it looks like the status line does kind of turn itself on. So I'll see if that's by design. I'll mention that to planning team. All right, so we see, uh, hi Greg, I was curious if it was possible to set up a macro to add a certain instrument with one click. For example, I use a stream deck for shortcuts and would like to program a button to automatically add my piano VST. I have, to s I have it set up to add an audio or instrument track, but it was hoping that there would be a way to make even quicker with less steps just by adding this specific instrument. Um, so as you do this, what you can't do in a macro um, is to actually define via text the, you know, so you can't say load Howlian. Uh, so you could load an instrument track, but you could probably through the stream deck, I think that there is like a multi-function buttons where you can say, I want to add an instrument track and then have it, you know, type H-A-L-I-O-N or the grand or whatever. And you might be able to do it through the stream deck, but I don't know of a way to have Cubase automatically generate the script to enter in letters as part of a macro process. Um, but I, I have asked for it. All right, and I did get a question about um, Studio Manager, which is kind of some Yamaha technology to integrate consoles. Um, so I was trying to find the downloads, uh, right before the live stream and I, I didn't find the download. So I will try to cover that in the next live stream or respond via email to that. So, um, sorry, I didn't get it figured out before the live stream just got in late last night. So I didn't get a chance to play with that. All right. So we got a couple minutes left. Let's go back to our chat, our live questions. Thanks for all the great questions. If you've learned something new, make sure you do hit the like button. reading through comments. All right, so um, I just see the embedded BPM uh, that could be moved or added somehow to a different workspace. I would like to uh, change on my mixer window. So, you know, uh, so with the BPM, so if it's if you just want to see what the tempo is, again, uh, if you go to the transport and go to the transport panel, you could see the tempo indicated here, and this is um, you know freely floatable anywhere. So let me know if that's what you mean. If you just wanted to see only the tempo, and then you could go to settings where you only see the tempo, so you could change the tempo right there.
We see there's 127 likes already, so thank you. All right. We see Jeff Zabelski hooked up a second monitor for his new window, so it's lots of fun. All right, we'll see if there's any more questions that come in. If not, we could wrap up just a couple minutes earlier. Um, okay, so you just see, uh, could it be moved? So yeah, this, I guess, is with the floating window. So this floating window could be moved freely anywhere to any monitor on your computer. So let me know if that works for you, Tyrone. All right, so we see Pablo says it was a great hangout. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess we'll wait about 30 seconds and wrap up. There's usually a bit of a delay. If not, we'll wrap up just a couple minutes early. And once again, just a quick reminder. Um, and uh, all right, so we see just the BPM for the, uh, for the transport. So all you need to do is just come over here to the transport panel and if you wanted to see, just go to the setup window here. And let's go to setup. And I just wanted to see tempo and time signature so I could. So now when I go to my transport panel, all I see is, and we could resize that. So now this is only the BPM that's floating around. All right, let's see if there's anything else to comes up all right so once again just a quick uh reminder that the next live stream won't be on friday but will be on saturday so if you know people that you know maybe had work commitments uh or something that you can't normally attend let them know uh but we'll be doing it saturday at 1 p.m i may wait till sunday to do the uh, index but we should have the index done for tonight's live stream uh, done later this evening. I wanna thank everyone for the great questions and we'll see everyone on Saturday. Have a great rest of the week and everyone please stay safe and healthy. Take care.